At the far end there is the inlets, and we'll walk over there later, but the inlets there, it's 192 feet from the inlet point to the exit points here. So they go down that bank, get down six feet under, and they go all the way down here. And then they come up in this area here, they make their turns, and they are minimum five feet apart. And I may not reflect that here, because I had to get them to line up, so at this point, but in the ground, that one is like where, where that tripod is, and this one's like over here. So if you measure, I think it's five feet. So there were actually three tubes. Three tubes. Is there a relationship between the distance and temperature, I guess? Yeah. Definitely there is. Our length is 192 feet. That is probably m more by about 40 or 50 feet, 25% more than what most people would probably need. The normal length on these things is probably somewhere between 60, 75, and 150 is about the top end on most of them. In our situation, we had to make it that long because I couldn't terminate those in the driveway. I didn't want people running over them. You, you, you don't want to drive around them. You don't really. So I just went you know, out to where they wouldn't be disturbed. And at some point I had envisioned, and we still may do it, planting some low shrubbery around there so we don't have to keep on replacing that Rime fabric every year. So we'd have some shading and cooling natural as, instead of the wire houses that they're in. The second part of that question is, is there a relationship between the length and the heat or cool? And yes, of course, the longer the tube is, the more opportunity the air is going to have to gather heat from its surroundings. A lot of it has to do with heat, so you know, that'll come out once in a while, but it's really cool we're mainly talking about. At some point, there's a diminishing returns. I mean, it would, you don't really want to have to put in an intense amount of energy in those fans or make that solar chimney like half the size of the building to pull from 500 feet away. At some point it just is too long. It just, there's a, it's, it's, it shuts down the flow. It doesn't, um, or it slows down the flow and it just isn't worth the expense in the, of the tubing to go out that far. And even at this point we're, we're you know, over the normal limit. When I envisioned doing this, I always envisioned like using a hill. So you had it in the ground five feet, but you were up above so the cold would drop. Wouldn't that speed up the flow? That would help, but the reason we didn't go on the bank was mainly because of the, of the limitations of the construction equipment that couldn't really work right, on sure. the bank. Yeah. We had initially planned on doing it that way, but uh, when you talk about going at the top of the bank, going into the depth that we need to keep it level, you're talking about a hole that's 12, 15 feet deep, and that requires bringing in a whole other piece of equipment with an extremely long digging thing or just taking the whole bank out. The aiming of the pipe slightly downhill in our case, which is mainly for drainage, but also it helps because cool air moves down. It helps it flow in the, in the correct direction. You know, we wanted to go from there to there and it's tilted a little bit. The standard slope or pitch on a pipe for water is one quarter inch to the foot. If you figured that out for that length, it would be like we'd have a six foot difference, if not more. That's too much. So we, you know, we, we made it, we pitched it, we didn't pitch it you know, that much. It's probably not even an eighth. It's just enough to get the water in the right direction and the flow, you know, in the right direction. And how do you monitor the water? We don't really. I mean, I, I have, if I hear gurgling, if I would hear, that's how I'd monitor it. If I hear, if I turn those fans on and I would hear, you'll hear like a drumming. It's almost like a, oh, oh, and, it, and it, it almost like, you could go up there to the end there and tap on it with a hammer and the water sort of has the same the same sound when it when it gets disturbed, so you know that you've had a problem. If the, if the flow were to stop altogether, even if the fans were on, you'd know you'd have a problem because that means the water has risen to the point where it's blocked a transition someplace. You got a 90 degree angle, the water comes, all it has to come is six inches, and that's it, shuts so it off. So the water's from condensation? Yeah, the water's gonna be from condensation, which in our area normally isn't a problem. Now, if we had summers, if we had like a, a, a long extended, very humid summer, we might start seeing it. At some point here, Stand pipes are buried. They're only about six to 12 feet, inches under, and the caps are there, so we just pull, dig a little hole, pull the caps out, and stick our shop back in there to suck the water out. So that, that's the way to do it. It's really much, much better than jamming a hose, trying to get the hose through all these bends, and you could do it, but it would be awful. Um, so that's why we did it out here. Um, I've seen some people do piping where it's, sort of woven underneath instead I may, I may be wrong, but you may be looking at ground coupled heat pump piping. They'll drill either a well and do a vertical, you know, do a vertical pipe, or they'll do a serpentine 
three foot down, maybe maybe more, but generally it's about three or well, it could be up to six. And they'll do a th it's a thinner. It's not that nearly that thick. So if if you unless you saw a big thick pipe, at least four inches, if the pipe you saw was thinner, that's a that's a geothermal um, heat pump pipe. Yeah. You know. Could you use it in this scenario? And too thin, too small. How far apart? Five feet. Five feet for each course. Five. So you got five feet of earth between each. The pipes themselves, you know, I'm going to say four to twelve. It could be four to ten. Uh, six is great because it, I mean, just it's available. It's fairly inexpensive. I I wrote it down. I think it's a dollar sixty-two a foot. And would it be easier to get the air to flow and go up the thermal chimney with the bigger pipe or a smaller pipe? Um, if you used a bigger pipe, you'd have to have a bigger chimney, and and you may not want to dedicate that much size. This, I calculated that a little bit small for, I, I probably should have more surface area on that um, collector, not just to let in more sunlight and energy, but also to broaden the wings so the sun has more effect at the extremes in the early morning and the late day. That thing on the top has really made all the difference in the world because that covers any errors of calculation that I might have done. That turbine takes almost nothing to move. It's like a four, 3.9 mile an hour wind, something like that. And once that starts, no matter whether the sun's shining or not, it's going to start sucking. So that's been really, really good. So that's always, in fact, that, I think that may be some of the reason why we haven't had the condensation because the thing's almost always on. I rarely see that not spinning. That's a pretty good spin now. But I mean, it's always doing something. I mean, it, I rarely see it stopped. If I was going to do this one over again, I would, I would broaden this by at least eight inches, maybe even a full foot, and make a nice big window. Is that oriented due south? It's due south. Yeah, that angle right there is directly south. You had said corrugated pipe for several reasons. One of the expense, one is the nice hydraulic smoothness of the inside of that pipe, and the other is basically just maintenance and longevity of this pipe. It's really nothing's going to happen to this over time. And, you know, we'll all be gone by the time this deteriorates, if it ever will. I mean, maybe out here it might. I mean, just uh, somebody might hit it or the sun might eventually get through. But under the ground, it's, you know, it's, it's there. Um, corrugated steel and a lot of other things are going to deteriorate. Corrugations are going to make an entirely different dynamic in the way the air flows through there. It's not, and it's not to say that it doesn't work. And a lot of people have used corrugated, but that's a whole different um, calculation schedule. Because what we've got here is what's called laminar flow. It's a very smooth, it's like playing cards that are... You know, when you shuffle a car, you know, they, sl they slip next to each other. So you've got laminar, laminar flow going on, very slick, very smooth. And it is not so rough that it's um, allowing the air not to have the opportunity to catch th the coolness of the soil around it. It's, it's going slow enough, and it's going long enough, and it's going not tumbly enough that it, it can actually just, you know, draws from the perimeter of the pipe, the, uh, you know, the... The center, I don't, I don't believe the center makes a, a whole effect on it. It's mainly around the outer perimeter of the inside of the pipe is what's catching the coolness. And um, if you were to do it with a corrugated pipe or a spiral pipe or whatever, you might have improvements in many ways. One, one improvement would be for sure, can you, you can think of it? Think what it would be. I mean, you've got a piece of pipe that's straight and it's, say, three feet long. And then you start putting corrugation into it. That three-foot-long pipe is now four feet long, but we just smushed it. So you got a lot more surface area. So that's, you know, for what you might lose in, in turbulence, that's, there's laminar flow and there's turbulent flow. So what you might lose in turbulence, you probably well, well gain in, um, in your uh, ex exposed and increased surface area. The reason I didn't want it, because I took one look at a piece of, you know, eight inch, whatever it was, pipe at 20 feet, corrugated steel, it was, the price was just out of, this, out of this world. So I think you just don't need that. So we can come in and look at in the inside where other stuff's going on. How did you choose that there were three pipes coming out? Because I only had to work with, we had a very limited access, we had a very limited site situation. I have to have five feet between, I have to have a certain depth, and I have to have a certain length. So between those things, the length is actually, I could have played with that a little bit, but I couldn't play with, we don't want to cut the bank back anymore. I can't move the building. So I guess I'm curious, if you had had the option, would you have put more pipes in? I probably would have put a shorter run with more pipes, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or bigger, bigger, bigger pipes, but if they cost it out too much, I wouldn't have done that. And if you have more pipes, you can do less distance? Yes, then? yes. Okay. Because, no, I'm sorry, so yeah. five feet is to equilibrate the temperature? Yes, five? because there's a certain amount of storage in the soil. And... And it's being 
the store, it's just like a, your bank account. The storage is being sucked out constantly. So uh, if you had only a foot between, you got two pipes working or three pipes working and you have only a foot between them, at some point on a, on a hot day and, you want, and you're asking for more cool, it's going to run out of cold. The bigger, the more storage you have, like a water tank, or a big bank account. The more storage you have, the more, you know, the more you can draw on before it comes to, um, you know, a point where it's starting to pull warmer air. So if you had more room, would you have made it even further apart? Yeah, probably not a whole lot more. I mean, maybe ten feet or something. Uh, well, at the most, yeah. I mean, depends on. I mean, we had a big field in a in a residence in a house, which which isn't really the point of this exercise. But in a house, you you would definitely have shorter pipes and probably a lot more, probably more like ten or twelve pipes, and you'd have space of probably eight or maybe even 10 feet between if you could fit that on your, depending on how your house is. But you know, they, there's different designs so they can pull them in. They can have a big broad field and then they come back in like a V. But um, uh, you know, five foot is about the minimum. That's, I guess that's the best. They really don't want to go a whole lot lower. I saw some that were like three feet or so. But I think that might be asking too, you know, too much. If you, got a, if you had a smaller diameter pipe and you were asking less of it in the way of heat transfer, then you could work with three feet or so. But, but five for this size pipe is going to be about it, about good, you know. So besides a, a geothermal heat pump, mm -hmm. do you see this system more as a passive system being used in a uh, house or...? Very, very rarely. And the main reason for that is that we have air quality control issues like humidity control and mold and whatever control that um, have to be dealt with or planned ahead of time. So you don't have the issue. We built a house in Transylvania County. Um, many years ago, 1982 or something, and used a much bigger pipe. Uh, I really don't remember how big they were. They were quite big, maybe 16 inches. And uh, shorter runs, bigger pipe, further apart, and just a lot of issues with, with not a you know, moldy smell, but moisture, a lot of humidity issues. And, you know, um, I, I, you know, I never don't remember actually seeing mold, but I can, can't imagine it wouldn't be a problem in that. So you'd have to deal with that. It means more getting more away from passive, more into active systems, so you have active fans, active filters, active blockage, you know, active devices to pull that moisture out before it gets to the human nose. You, you know, think so. it's worth pursuing, or might she just look at geothermal? I would go, the, the, efficiency of, the efficiency of geothermal and of air conditioners in general today is so great that I would probably look for buying solar panels as cheap as they are today, and running your air conditioner off a either a grid tide or just a solely um, dedicated uh, uh, solar direct to, to um, heat pump system, and I'd, you, because then you'd have heating, cooling, uh, t total knob control. Weather wouldn't make a whole lot of difference because your sun's. You know, you may have some issues with swings. You may have to look at batteries or a grid tie to keep it consistent, but I think, I think that you'd probably be better at that point. Um, you know, I just hate to say that, but at least you're dr driving it solar. The only thing bad with that is you have maintenance issues. Any heat pump is going to be a maintenance. You can't just turn it on and forget it. You're going to have an annual, you know, expense in having a guy come out and adjusting things, looking at things, changing filters, and stuff like that. This could be useful. I mean, they have these, um, you know, water cooling systems for greenhouses, mm -hmm. and they're useless in our climate. Right. Right. We yeah. Have so much humidity. The humidity. Yeah. They only so work these, in this dry climate. Help for that. Yes. It's cool for for growing mm -hmm. starts in the summer. And stuff. If we had a hot, humid climate, like like I said, Louisiana or parts of Florida or wherever else it might be hot and humid, the system would not really work as well at all. Yeah, I mean, you still need it's still hot and you still need the cold, but it's not going to deliver the cold as uh, through the whole season. It's going to be it's going to be effective, you know, quite a bit of it, but it's not going to carry it through the whole thing. And then you'll have your humidity and and moisture issues. So. Um, so I think we can go in now. We screeded the concrete and sealed it. Still too rough a surface to clean because the soldier flies do tend to breed out of their environment sometimes. So they get around and they walk around and stuff. So, uh, so we have to sweep out sometimes and don't throw them out. We put them back in or, or into the tubs, which well, we don't have a tub here, but there's basically pails. There's an exit hole for the larvae and then there's a pail that they get in so we can put them back in the pail and use them for the... Uh, the chickens, but um, uh, essentially, after a couple months, we realized that we needed something more washable and more smooth. So we just got some cheap, durable vinyl flooring and put it in here. Unfortunately, as I said before, the other uh, 
this winter we had an extremely long spell of cold weather. And the pumping system, this, this floor system only, it works in, uh, it's not a pressurized system, it's just a, whatever pressure the pump makes, which is only about three pounds, it's nothing really. Uh, um, and uh, it, it, is not, it is not glycol, there's no antifreeze in the water, it's just, it's just hot water from the tanks in there, from our process. So uh, uh, unfortunately we had such a cold probably eight days of pretty, pretty cold temperatures. And one weekend when, of course, nobody was here, for some reason, not this part, but the exit from the building to the, um, even though the water was flowing, the exit, the exit from the building to the um, piping, which goes underground and then comes up and is insulated, stopped. Now the reason, it, it didn't stop when it was flowing. It, it the temp, the thermometer, was basically saying it's warm enough, it was telling it it's warm enough in here to shut the pump off, but when we shut the pump off, which is fine in here, so this wouldn't freeze, it, it froze out there. So we're gonna have to re, completely rethink that, uh, maybe just running it all the time, or probably get in there and definitely bury, you know, insulate the heck out of all that stuff During there. cold times, it can get a lot warmer in here. Yeah, and exactly. That's the way to do it. But, yeah. But push it, hit 85, that'll keep it running. Yeah, right, we just wanna keep it moving, that's basically, and that was, my fault for telling Dan that, you know, the certain level was here and he's like, oh, I'll it off, you know, so we adjusted it and, you know, and, and, and then he took the blame because he had put it in. <laughs> we're, we're all, all, all blame, blamed ourselves. Victims of the reality that it, everything is connected. Yeah, it is. And the, and the connection on our end is we had to take a concrete uh, chisel and locate the leak. You can sort of hear it. I mean, you can sort of hear just little splits in the pipes. Um, because once, once that stopped, then the heat just started oozing out of here, and it didn't ooze from this part. It got from the bottom, and uh, and just froze the water in the pipes, and just split the pipe in a couple places, just in that end. And I'm assuming because it's just the cold wind coming from that end, because that's how the wind was blowing that that weekend, and um, it just split it. So we had to chisel it up, look, put air through, drain the whole thing, put air through, and you could hear the hissing. And then we patched it, and then next hiss and patched it until it stopped hissing, and then we put pressure on it. Um, at 80 pounds and just waited till it, I mean, just it wasn't moving, so we knew it was fixed. So uh, then, we, you know, patched everything back up, put the new floor in, and, uh, you know, all set. So that won't happen again. But, um, um, you know, so that's one, you know, one thing with radiant floor heating. But in a normal situation, this whole thing would be in the earth, so you wouldn't have that problem. It would be, it would be in the earth and insulated all around and in the bottom, so uh, it, the temperatures wouldn't get that way but we're in a special situation. So you can see the, uh, if you look in here, you can see the, here's the enter, entrance to the, you can actually see the little spinning thing up there, all the way up there. And then you can see how thick the two layers of uh, insulation is, a total of R20 for the four inches, so it's two plus two. All the seams, everything's held back by these long, these five inch bolts with the big washers to hold everything back. This is actually, because the situation, we're dragging stuff in and out, we're bumping up against your tools and things. Um, this is actually sheet metal roofing, corrugated metal roofing before they corrugate it. So you can go up to the, you can go up to the factory up here in, on Sand Hill Road and just ask them to sell you rolls of this stuff before they start bending it. And it costs the same. And they have all different colors. So um, it's, a, it's a very durable uh, powder coat finish, extremely weather resistant, all that stuff. So we, um, that's what I got for this. It's cheap, fairly cheap. And, uh, you know, so we just put the lower, you know, we don't need it up here because we're not going to be messing with stuff up there. But down here, you're, you know, you're rubbing up against stuff. Um, let's see what else we have in here. This is the automatic door that Dan Hettinger finally, we worked it out because we have to have this. It has to be closed. If it gets too cold in here, it has to close this because we don't want cold air coming in. If it gets too, too hot in here, it has to be closed. Doesn't make, it doesn't totally make sense to so think about that chimney again. It has to be closed because the sealed box has to be sealed because that chimney is only going to work if, if all these doors are closed and that window is closed. The flies come in and out through here. Uh, probably could have made that bigger. We'll see how that, you know, how that's going to work. They worked last year, so we'll see. But uh, um, that's screened with a big wide screen, so rodents can't come in, but the flies can come in and out. Um, and the fans, you can see down there, 198 cubic feet per minute fan, which is, you know, fairly nice flow with... There's three of them, the one, two, three. They only use um, four-tenths of a watt each. I mean, amp each, so it's very minimal wattage. I think it's 38 watts 
think of a light bulb as 100 watts or 75 watts, so it's very minimal. They're not on all the time by any means. That thermostat up there, it's what they call a line voltage thermostat. So that reads the temperature of the air in here. And we set that thing so when it hits 86, I think it's 86 or 88, we've been running it at, those fans will come on. It doesn't matter what this is doing. I mean, ideally, this will be working this little butt off up here, making airflow, but if it's still too hot outside, that thing's going to kick in at 86 degrees. And then those fans will come on, then it will definitely force that cool air through. And, uh, you know, we, I, I was going to put in, and I'm glad I chose not to because basically the lights changed my mind, and uh, I'm going to put in tubing from the fans instead of having them end there. I was actually going to bring them out and stagger the exhausts one, two, three, but it would be a headroom issue. So I, did, I left it at the wall. It's a lot cleaner. It does the same thing. It's just coming right out here and right up that chimney. It doesn't matter. These two are on this side because you want the flow over here more than anything. And this one just goes down this one channel. This one, I'm sure, goes quickly. And, you know, it's the first one to there. But, you know, these other ones will, will move air along here. So uh, the reason this is up on a pedestal is because we have plumbing pipes that connect from the tanks. This is only a one tank. We have another one over there. And we have a third one in building. But um, uh, so the tanks, we can drain them. There's some effluent that comes out over time. So we open the valves and just let it, let it come out, and we use that, too. We don't throw much of anything out here. Oh, this here, is, it's, been, it's been taken off now, but this was the, uh, water, the water curtain. Ma automatic valve goes on here, and that when the temperature hits um, a certain temperature, then the water automatically turns on and showers the walls with, with water. That, that's not a continuous thing, because you don't want to waste that much water, but it, it doesn't take much. It's like five minutes of that, and it's, it's cool for a while, and then it can do it again. I mean, that's, that's like a last resort kind of thing, but it should be done. I mean, you, you, you know, I wouldn't, in, in this situation, it was fine. Um, I would probably, if it was my personal thing, I'd probably just get out there with a hose and do it with a garden hose. Um, yeah? Uh, the fan placement, being so close to ceiling, if you wanted to have more fans in here, mm -hmm. Would it change how efficient they are if there's a couple staggered? No, it wouldn't matter. Every fan has to have its own tube. So if you wanted to put six tubes in and you had the room out there in the soil to do that, I would put three more um, below the ones that are there or maybe even stagger them to a different schedule and then uh, hook them up to the tubes. It wouldn't change. It would, you know, it would only improve it, really. I'm just, it gives more energy, that's all. Right. Yeah. Those fans, by the way, are not quite a 50% pass-through. In other words, there's a free space. So when we don't need to have them on, we don't want something that's going to block, like a squirrel cage would be very restrictive in letting air flow past when it's not powered. In other words, if, you know, we want air to flow. We don't want those blades blocking that flow. So you, you want to pick a fan that has a significant amount of free space between each blade so it'll flow without being hampered by the existence of the blades. I guess I'm also curious just about the placement of them. Do you feel like you'd get more airflow throughout the box if they were down the bottom versus the top, or um, and then there'd be less piping exposed? I was going to have ducts up there, so that's why they were up at the top, because you couldn't have ducts here. But then after we decided, before I actually didn't put the ducts, I thought, well, the hot air is probably going to rise anyway, so it's going to be, they're still going to be effective up there. And so far, that was right. I mean, I, you could pull them down a little bit. I wouldn't put them at the bottom. I would, I would put them... You know, I put them um, mid, you know, from the middle up, the upper part. Yeah, but they have worked out, you know, pretty well at this point. So something that we should make sure people know too is that this is a lot of infrastructure for three bins. At some point down the road, after we're way more certain about how production is and all that, we will turn this into one big trough and get much more space out. Yeah, you know, yeah. much more production. The bins are just right because we're still working it out. We don't want to have a permanent structure in here yet. Right. Right. And the good thing about the container, too, is if even if any of this didn't work at the end of the day for whatever reason, this building is still a great, this whole exercise is a great lesson in how to insulate. This is about the cheapest way to insulate this, this size of a, or a container of any size, really. I mean, it's just, it's just a really good insulation method. It works, you know, really well. And I think the price, I mean, the spray-on foam, which is the other option, I wouldn't use um, batting or anything like that. That You can't get wet. It, it has to be something that doesn't mind being moist. The spray-on foam was easily a third more money uh, doing it that way. And it's also messy. I mean, it's bumpy, and it's, it's, it looks like something out of a, either a, you know, an alien film, movie or something like that. It's just really weird. And they can, they can shave it, but it still doesn't look very good. Does this off-gas? Uh, no, because this stuff is the green 
There's actually little bubbles in here. So to make those bubbles happen, they're microscopic. To make them happen, they used to put Freon in there. And that's what off gases. Now this is pushed in with a, with a, a carbon, I think it's carbon dioxide. I'm not positive. I shouldn't say that. But, I, but it's something that's uh, very benign. So it is a green insulation. I, was, I did that on purpose. You know. So yeah, that was one. You don't want it off gassing at all. Because even when it, even if you say, oh well, in a year it's okay, it's, somebody has suffered. I mean, it's you know, it's gone out there and that doesn't help. It's not the fault. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I don't think there's anything else in here. We're gonna go back in and I want to go over a little bit on our handouts just to make sure everybody understands everything.